Good afternoon and welcome to this THF conversation celebrating National Engineers Week. I'm Cynthia Jones, Director of Henry Ford Museum of American Innovation. Uh, for those of you who might be blind or low vision, I'll do a description of myself today. Uh, so I am a white middle-aged woman, longish brown hair. I'm wearing glasses. And today you'll see me on this virtual uh, experience. I'm wearing a patterned sweater, blue pattern against a teal background. Um, so for those of you that are tuning in new to THF Conversations, this is a wonderful series where we like to interview folks who are doing um, great work out in the community, folks that we see as leaders in their field. And today we're focusing in on engineering and engineering our future with a wonderful um, selection of folks across various areas of that discipline of engineering, but also various parts of their careers. And it is my opportunity to welcome today's guest moderator, uh, Dr. Delian Tolbert-Smith. Um, she's a good friend of the Henry Ford and uh, someone that we're so excited for you to meet through this conversation. Uh, Delian is an assistant professor in industrial and manufacturing systems engineering at the University of Michigan in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, Delian is also very committed to creating resources that introduce engineering to many new audiences. And hopefully today, uh, we're introducing engineering to new audiences. Delian, we'll take it away with you. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I'll take a moment to um, describe myself. I am a Black woman in my 30s. I uh, Today I have big hair, so <laughs> and I am against a, a, a teal background as well. I'm wearing an orange top and a multicolored vest. And I am pleased to be here to um, speak with you all today to moderate on both uh, what we were celebrating as um, E-Week, our Engineers Week, but also during Black History Month. It is just such um, a privilege to be able to moderate this conversation considering the legacy of engineers that I also come from. I thought I'd share or start our conversation with just a few notes. Um, Tricia Hatley was the president of the National Society of Professional Engineers from 20. 2020 to 2021, and she has a few insights about engineering that I thought would be fitting for us. Um, she says, the world needs more engineers. In the US, only uh, roughly 18,000 engineers will turn 69 every year for the next 15 years. And this reflects a broader trend. America's senior population is expected to nearly double over the next three decades. And it's not just the population that's aging, our infrastructure is too. She makes another note about engineering. She says, recruiting the next generation of engineers requires innovation too. Historically, the engineering workforce has been overwhelmingly white and male, but meeting the challenges of the modern world will require engineers of all backgrounds. The um, National Society of Professional Engineers and other organizations such as SWE, they're fighting to make the engineering workforce tomorrow more divor di uh, diverse, more inclusive, and more representative of the society that it benefits. She says, my hope is that the future includes a more diverse group of individuals who find ways to leverage their engineering education to improve our society. She finishes, engineers of the future will know how their work makes our world a better place and students in grade school will aspire to be an engineering hero. And in spite of engineering heroes, I'm excited for those that you're going to meet in our conversation today. And our conversation will include, I'll call you all engineering heroes and you represent different capacities. You have different experiences and perspectives um, about how you're seeing and doing engineering work and the inspiration that you all provide the next generation and even have been gleaning from as you've been um, climbing the ladders. And so with that, I want to thank each panelist for being here. I ask that you'll introduce yourself and just share um, about a bit about the organizations you represent. And of course, if you can include a physical description, that would be wonderful. I would like to first begin um, with Teresa Ramirez Zipster. Can, Zipster, can you please um, sh turn on your camera and introduce yourself? Hello, thank you so much, Dr. Delian. I appreciate that. I am Teresa Ramirez Zipser from Wayne State University. I'm the STEM Engagement Coordinator. I'm a cis woman with long, straight black hair, 
wearing a bright blue top today and a navy blue blazer. And I have a festive background with about 35 different flags from around the world. Thank you, nice to have you. Um, Victoria, can you please introduce yourself, please? Yeah, hello everyone, my name is Victoria. I am a project manager at Aero Electronics and in my 20s, uh, late 20s. And I currently am wearing a white blouse with a red patterned kind of sweater jacket. Um, I've got my hair pulled back and I got curly hair and I'm wearing glasses. I also have a dragon in my background, a purple one. <laughs> <laughs> we need to know that and we'll find out more about that soon. Uh, John, please, you're next. Yeah, hello, I'm John Nunley. I'm the Senior Vice President of uh, Engineering at and IT at Hitachi Estemo. And Hitachi Estemo is a uh, automotive supplier and we're a global supplier that supplies to almost all of the global uh, OEMs. Um, I'm a white male. I think I still sneak into middle-aged and I've got a beard, a blue shirt, and I like to say I have blonde hair, but it's, it's tough to see it. Um, in my background, I have a lot of uh, race cars. Um, Hitachi Estemo is very involved in uh, international racing from IndyCar to IMSA and a lot of uh, motorcycle racing also. Thank you all. Thank you, Engineering Heroes, for joining us today. So um, we were going to start with just some group questions. Um, each of us, each panelist will respond briefly to the, the question. And then I actually have some specific questions for each of you. Um, and so let's begin with one of the group questions. We all know that the Henry Ford provides such a unique educational experience and different types of experiences based off of all their objects and artifacts, stories that they've been collecting from over 300 years of tradition, of ingenuity, resourcefulness, and innovation. And their collection of more than 26 million artifacts really helps to inspire more learners. I, I, visit, I visited just recently and just got to see how the, the young people's eyes lit up at seeing what was available, even the race cars at the, at the museum. And so I wonder if we can start with Teresa, who or what experiences inspired you to reach the position you're in today? And what drives you to continue? Teresa, can you start for it, please? please? Yeah, of course. Thank you. I think my biggest motivation and what fuels me is my upbringing from Southwest Detroit. I, you know, having scarce resources and not many opportunities available to me growing up. It was first JROTC that gave me that initial reward and um, discipline type of system. Um, and then really as a young professional, it was Monica Martinez from Comerica Bank. Um, who stepped in as my mentor and helped me understand and see for myself the potential that I have and uh, my unique story that I can apply um, to really make a difference. And that is really what drives me to this day. I love that you mentioned, I did not do JROTC, but I've heard so many stories of what that develops in young people. And so when I think about that coupled with mentorship, I mean, just being cared for, um, being thought about, being people looking out for you and developing you, that has such an impactful, um, it plays an impactful role in engineers. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Victoria? Yeah, so for me, um, what's inspired me is just helping people. That, that's my passion, that's my drive, is to use the skills and the talents that I have to make a difference in the world and in people's lives. And engineering is just a path that I chose to go down to do that. Um, and for me, it, the, it, the inspiration and the motivation that I got from was mainly from my family. Um, they saw what talents and skills that I had and were accepting of the direction that I wanted to take um, and just continue to push me in that direction and encourage me to go in that direction. Um, so. Yeah, that's kind of how I got to where I am. And that, that still what motivates me to this day is just to continue to use my skills to help people. Thank you. I often, I meet students who don't think that they can use engineering to help people because they perceive it as a, you know, you're just focused on one task, you're away from everyone. And while that could be an element of engineering, I really am so glad you talked about, you can look out in your community, look out and see needs 
and develop engineering solutions to meet those and let that be the driver for your work. That's really great. I know we're going to hear more about how you did that soon. So I won't, I won't, <laughs> I won't get too ahead of myself. <laughs> John, what inspires you? What, what continues to inspire you? Well, I, you know, I always feel like I should have a really interesting answer to that. Um, there's so many great innovators and engineers, the Henry Fords and Elon Musk's and uh, Thomas Edison's that you can really look up to, but they don't really, I don't know them. They don't really touch me um, like people that I've worked for. Um, but I've always known I was going to be an engineer. I came from a family of bankers and lawyers, but since I was in middle school, I uh, always knew I was going to be an electrical engineer and just followed that path the whole way. But once I became one, really the people that I work with, um, bosses that kind of guided me um, were what inspired me to continue to grow and develop as an engineer. So I, I think it's, uh, it can be anything, you know, inspiration can come from anywhere. It can come from your family. It can come from your religion. It can come from your pets. It can come from anything, but what's important is what you do with it. Um, and that you stick with it and you have the motivation once you're inspired to really accomplish something with that inspiration. I, I, you said what it's important what you do with it. Inspiration can come from anywhere, but it's really important what you do with that. And I, what I see even teaching our future engineers is they don't often know what to do with that. They don't know what tools. So I, so I was inspired when I saw you, we, we were chatting before about animals and how might an animal inspire an innovative approach to solve a problem or watching how a flower blooms might provide a solution for another engineering problem. And um, in our model, in the Model I curriculum at the Henry Ford, it teaches different habits and actions of innovators. And we also, there are also competitions to help really instill those ways of thinking to help, um, to help young learners become more innovative. And so as you're thinking about your career and um, your education, what tools or resources did you use to inspire you to be innovative, to help you with innovation? And um, would you recommend some specific ones that maybe we should try to help us become innovative? Teresa? Can you please repeat that? I think uh, my audio cut out for a moment. Yes, yeah, so thinking about um, being inspired to be innovative. So the Model I curriculum um, teaches habits and actions. Can you all hear me well? Okay, so the Model I curriculum teaches habits and actions. And John talked about, um, John talked about how he's inspired by the things around him. So Teresa, can you um, think what inspires you and what tools help you to be innovative, to think outside the box? Oh gosh. Well, you know, in my career, I've often been relegated to a one person team um, without colleagues and without the ability to glean from other people's, you know, nuance, ideas and feedback. So that's been really a difficult thing uh, for me professionally. But having said that, you know, I do still lean on colleagues across departments, across teams and people who are in other fields such as communications or marketing. Um, and I tap into things that they've learned and tools that they've adopted to rethink processes and rethink ways to approach bringing students on board to different experiences, whether that's a STEM program or uh, some type of a competition, um, but really trying to think holistically beyond what I myself have been immersed in. I think listening to you, what I was gleaning is that you, you work with others to think outside the box and that tool of listening to others and even seeking out other people to help you um, be innovative or to address a challenge that you might be facing. Does that, does that resonate with your experience? Okay. <laughs> yeah, definitely, well said. I think often we, we think engineering tools are software, which is great. Um, or it could be specific processes or methods, also great. But we also have to, the skill that you just talked about, being able to work well with others is a definite, um, and the people are a resource. We are resources to one another. So thank you for that. Um, John or Victoria, did either of you want to talk about resources that you use to help be innovative? 
Yeah, um, I, I relate to what Teresa was saying. The National Society of Black Engineers is an organization that I was a part of in college um, and still a part of today in the professional area. And that group of like-minded individuals is what I think really helped me to um, learn what thinking innovatively could look like and how collaborating um, with innovative ideas can, can look and feel like. Um, which is something that I, I love uh, it, with the teamwork is being able to work with other individuals um, that have different ideas, that have different experiences to be able to come up with solutions to help um, to help someone with a, with a problem. So actually I'll pull in the example of the project, My Dragon is um, the project that I worked on for the Make-A-Wish, um, Wake Make-A-Wish recipient. Um, and she asked for a robotic dragon and so I had to then, as a project manager, um, pull together a, a group of individuals that have a certain set of skills, but also have a different way of thinking um, so that we can come together to say, all right, well, she wants this and she wants this. How do we pull that together? Who can we pull in to, to make it work, um, to make it happen and, and, and integrate it into the project um, and into this, this companion that Belle wants? So, um, yeah, just working in teams, I think, is is the biggest, biggest area that I feel like innovation is is seen. So it's best in, pra in practice, you work with others. <laughs> and that's, I really, I keep hearing that. I think about one of the tools that help with um, encouraging innovation when I'm teaching my students is we use something online called Padlet. And it's a brainstorming tool and they're able just to post ideas and comment on each other's ideas. And I've seen that tool, just the practice of being able to write an idea and post it somewhere and let other people see it and get their feedback and re revise. Um, that practice is so beneficial and we can do it on our own, <laughs> but it really does help to, to work with others. Like you said, like-minded people and even some people who don't think similarly to really challenge those ideas. Um, thank you so much. John, did you want to add anything to this? Yeah, I think uh, the best tools are uh, Wikipedia and Google. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, those are useful, but I do want to piggyback on what you just said about brainstorming, because that's, that's what I was going to mention is brainstorming is such a valuable tool, but you have to be very careful about how you pick your brainstorming teams. If you pick a bunch of people who look just like you and are your age and think just like you, the brainstorming isn't so useful. So you really want to get people of all ages, all races, all nationality together. And that can be a very useful, innovative brainstorming team. Um, diversity is so important in innovation. Um, the, you know, they say necessity is the mother of invention, but I think diversity is the father or at least the brother, because if every, if you always think about the problem in the same way, you're always gonna come to the same answer. So you really need people who look at things differently and come at things from a completely different background and angle um, to really get innovative solutions and things. You know, I love that you said that. I think our old way of thinking about diverse teams was sometimes checking a box. Just make sure you just have these different perspectives just because you just should have different perspectives. But we are seeing more and more when we when our teams lack those diversely rich experiences and, and, um, and perspectives, we lose out on time. We spend too much time developing solutions that may not even meet the need. We might misunderstand the need. Um, we lose financial resources, and then, then, and on top of that, and we're excluding voices that should be at the table. It's just the benefit of having a diverse team, a, a way of thinking, whether that's racial, gender, we like faith. It, what those those experiences are important. So thank you, you thank you all for sharing that. Um, this kind of goes right into the next question about collaboration. Um, I've heard you all talk about it. It's not engineering is rarely a singular job. Even if you have one sole project or one, one piece of the puzzle, it fits into this larger, larger task that must be done. Um, and so th there are engineers in every industry collaborating with many others to reach a common goal. 
um, whether it's to build a robot, uh, a community to center or to code or power autonomous vehicle. So what I would like to ask you all is, can you tell us how you apply the concept of collaboration in your specific roles? And um, how might we encourage young, young engineers, maybe young professionals or even pre-college students um, to collaborate, to develop that collaborative mindset? So the question is two-pronged. How do you see this playing out in your specific roles? And then how can we encourage more young learners to, to be collaborative? And just because we finished with John, I'm going to change the order up. John, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think um, the collabor you know, there's a difference between an innovator and an engineer. An innovator can be anyone. Anyone can innovate. Engineering is a very specific discipline that innovators need to get a product to market, right? So in my position, or even as you get into engineering management and things, there's no way you can know everything that you need to know to take an idea, to go through the process of building the specifications for the idea, you know, what kind of environment is it gonna operate in? How long do you want it to work? Um, and then the production process and the production equipment and everything that you need to get from an idea to a product, there's no way one person's going to know everything along that whole line to get a product out the door. So in engineering, collaboration isn't just a nice thing, it's a necessity. I mean, it's something that you have to do every day. Um, you can do a, we, we talked about brainstorming, we talked about all these different things, but just by its very nature, engineering has to be a collaborative profession, right? Thank you, thank you for adding that. It's a necessity. That's, that's a point I took away from what you shared. Uh, Victoria, what are your thoughts on your, the role of collaboration in, in your position and then the importance or even a strategy for encouraging the next generation to be collaborative? Yeah, um, I agree with what John was just saying. It's a necessity. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to be a project manager in engineering is because of the collaboration that is needed to make a project happen, um, to get it into production and to manufacturing. Um, a lot of the folks, like I was saying a little earlier about the Make-A-Wish project that I was a part of, I had to work with mechanical engineers, industrial engineers, electrical engineers, um, folks who were in sales, folks who were in marketing to be able to pull the whole project together. Um, and that took collaboration to make it happen. Um, one of the steps that we took to foster that collaboration is what we call the ideation session here at Arrow. So we'll invite the customer, we'll invite some of the engineers that we think will fit well initially with the project and just come together and brainstorm and just start talking about, okay, here's the problem, what's potential solutions that we could um, pursue and how we could um, engineer, you know, these certain types of challenging features for the projects. So um, yeah, ideation, brainstorming, collaboration is all a part of getting to the, the end product. Um, for the students out there, I would say a strategy you could take is to be a part um, of a organization or a club or group that um, works in teams. So I talked about National Society of Black Engineers before. I wish I was a part of that when I was uh, a youngling uh, coming up in, in, in the grade school and everything like that, because the uh, they don't only teach you about STEM, but give you opportunities to do what I call like engineering, senior engineering design projects, right? To, to make a windmill together with other um, individuals in, in, in a part of the organization and things like that. And just kind of like take steps um, as you continue up through your education um, to find those opportunities to work in teams. So that would could be a strategy to take. That's such a great strategy. And for those students who have access to those teams um, at a young age, I highly, I just recommend what you just said. Find a team. If you can't find a team, create a club on your on your block of people who like to work together <laughs> to solve problems. That's such a good idea. Um, so thank you for that. 
And what, what about you, Teresa? What, what thoughts do you have about collaboration? And I know you've kind of touched on that a little bit before, but collaboration in your role and encouragement for the next generation of engineers to be collaborative. Teresa, your audio is not on yet. So as she's um, as she's preparing her answer, and um, I just wanted to talk about that too. I love what John was saying is that anyone can be innovative, but this distinction between innovation and being an engineer. If I can just get you to talk about that a little bit more, John, and maybe Victoria, if you have something you want to say about the unique, what does an engineer add to the problem space? When someone has a big idea, where does the engineer come in and what what what, what do we bring to the table? <laughs> well, we engineers bring how to take an idea and actually make a product out of it, right? So if you have an idea, you then have to know the specifications. So you have to define what are, what are the specifications to this thing I want to make. Um, that's all engineering, right? Um, that's product engineering. And then you have to design the software, the electrical hardware, the mechanical parts to meet the specification that you've defined. And then you have to write test specifications that test your part to make sure that it really meets the specification that you wrote at the beginning of the project. And that's just to get to a point where now, okay, now we have a project product that works, it meets our specification, it'll last as long as we want and in the environment we want, now we have to produce it. So then you need a whole nother set of engineers to look at production lines, production line design, production process, and all, and all of those things. So um, engineering is a very broad, broad term, but it's all of the steps necessary to take an idea from an idea to <laughs> reality, right? Absolutely. Thank you for that. I, it's so helpful to see that engineering, there's not one, just one type of engineer, but there's a whole system and we fit in many places of that system. Um, and there's methods that we apply, ways we think. Um, so that's, thank you for sharing that. Victoria, did you want to add anything to the unique role of an engineer and what they add to the innovative process? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, kind of just echoing what John was saying, you know, engineers is what brings ideas into fruition. Um, you know, you could take a, a, a marketing person's idea of how, how to build a building and say, okay, go do it. And they'll be like, what materials do I need? You know, how do, like, what kind of measurements do I look for? Like the specifications and requirements that are necessary to make that dream, that vision come true it needs engineers, needs um, people who are technically skilled to, to engineer that idea. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, emphasizing that I think is totally important. And um, something that I'll add kind of toward the tail end of it, like you have your engineers to kind of get you through the testing, get you through the prototyping and the building, but not only that, the safety aspect of it, something that um, I'm learning a lot with my projects is these certifications, the, the safety testing, the um, making sure that it's following under a certain set of safe guidelines to make the product um, uh, safe for use or safe for like the FDA, safe for consumption, right? That kind of thing. Um, that's also a big part of engineering as well that I don't think people really think about when they, when they come up with great ideas like they do. So. Yeah, and then, then also after that, you have the uh, recyclability and environmental impact now yep. that you have to consider that 20, 30 years ago, we didn't even consider those, those things when we were designing a part. So yeah. gotta save the oceans. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, thank you all. I just could not miss that opportunity to just really dive into what you know, into what we bring as engineers to the table. Um, Teresa, did you want to share, add anything to that? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much for bearing with my audio issues. Uh, yeah, I, I going back to the question you previously asked about collaboration and what 
to, you know, advise students to get them inspired um, to even get immersed or even get get involved in, in engineering and STEM activities. I think John brought up some really uh, fantastic points as well as Victoria. And I think I would echo all of those points. And I would also, you know, in that same vein, I would really just suggest um, a lot of people might not be comfortable with stepping outside of themselves, maybe they might be introverted. Um, and so working with teams might not be something that's as approachable for some students as it might be for others. But for those students, I would say, find a friend or two that you are comfortable with and DIY your own projects. And maybe you start by building some type of airplane or um, something that piques your interest and take it a step further from there if you're comfortable. That's great. I often think about a story I heard of a young man who was playing basketball and he kept, he had the issue of his basketball when he would shoot it, I guess where the, where um, the hoop was, it would roll into the street and it was unsafe. And he wanted to figure out a solution. He built a workaround to catch the ball so that it would not go into the street because he couldn't, the option, he did not have the option of moving the hoop. And so this is something, you know, as you're encouraging young engineers to look at the world around them find maybe the friends that for him, the friends he was playing basketball with or classmates or cousins or family members. And together you can start to develop solutions for the things around you and, and learn from that. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And I, the next question actually goes to you specifically, Teresa. First, I want to thank you for the work that you're doing um, with Wayne State and in our region with the Invention Convention and helping to get resources available and this invention experience for young learners. Um, and so in your work, you um, rep often represent voices in your community. You create pathways to STEM learning and you help educate and elevate students to prepare them to be the next generation of talent that we need in our society. Um, as a social innovator, can you share an example of how you've challenged the rules to make way for better opportunities for the next generation? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. I think challenging historic inequities is an extremely difficult thing to navigate, particularly in work environments that are lacking representation and leadership or maybe diverse viewpoints with seats at the table. And this is something I've definitely encountered quite often in my, work, my own work. But each time a new registration platform or technology is introduced or adopted, or when processes are streamlined in you know, organizations, it's usually the most underserved populations who get left out if proper consideration isn't given. Equitable access demands examining all aspects of what you're offering and who can actually reach those offerings. And so in a previous role where I managed the Hispanic initiative for a nonprofit targeting at-risk youth, I had to challenge our processes when I realized what we were, you know, the fact that we were making uh, the, the change to technology more difficult for Spanish speaking families in particular uh, and their ability to access our STEM programs, you know, after advocating for new pathways, such as allowing a paper registration uh, workaround alternative, you know, we saw a significant increase in Latinx membership that would not be attainable otherwise. And so it's just a clear example of how really looking at um, different viewpoints and hearing out those people that have that inherent experience and know exactly what occurs when things are advanced in technology without regard to who exactly you're targeting. So good example I could give you. Thank you for that. You know, it makes me, you, I had a second question for you and I, I think you answered that, but it had to just do with a favorite story um, of when a community benefited from, from your advocacy and from your work. And you've already, you shared a really powerful story. Did you want to share another or did you have another memory that, that comes to mind? Yeah, well, here at Wayne State University now in my current role, we're hosting, as you mentioned, the Regional Competition for Invention Convention Michigan. And it's a competition series where students pitch their original invention ideas. They can work on a team with other students or on their own. And as a regional hub level, we have the flexibility to alter the students' requirements to compete at our hub level before they advance to the state. And this year we heard from educators across our region that you know, their students would have a difficult time producing physical display boards since most of them are participating virtually and some are even working in teams virtually. So the thought of that physical board was just a hard bridge to cross for them. 
And so we decided to tweak this requirement this year and we allow students to actually submit their display board segments as PowerPoint slides. And then, you know, should they advance to the state level, they will paste, they will print those slides and paste them on their uh, display boards so that they could compete at the state level where the physical board is a requirement. So I think I can't wait to see how students, you know, put that into practice. And I love the idea that students have one less thing to worry about, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, um, as someone who has seen these classes, that that option was really helpful. It was it was accessible, and I'm always surprised that what little things can sometimes inhibit thinking, inhibit a student's ability to think outside the box, and just that change um, allowed them to think more broadly about what they could do, and that their ability to submit something to a venture convention. So thank you for that for sure. Um, Victoria, my, my next question goes to you. <clears throat> We've heard about you. You've mentioned this dragon a few times. And so I'm excited. I know that the listeners are just waiting on edge to hear about this dragon. And they see this beautiful picture or heard you describe it. So in your role at Aero Electronics, you have had a special opportunity to make a difference in one young girl's life that also has um, the, the potential to impact our society. Can you share a bit about what I know is called Bell's Dragon? and um, how your unique skill set as an engineer contributed to the overall success of this project. Victoria? Yeah, yeah. so um, Bell's Dragon is a project that came from the Make-A-Wish Foundation in Colorado, and they had a wish from a then 13-year-old Bell Cress to make a robotic dragon. She didn't want to go to Disney World, she did that already, so she wanted something I'm a little fancier. Um, and so she came to Arrow and we said, yeah, that's something we can do. We've got the resources, we've got the connections, um, we've got the components um, to be able to make a robotic dragon actually happen for this for this young girl's wish. So um, we came together and I talked about a little bit, it started with the ideation session. We said, okay, you know, we may not have anybody here in the States, or, I mean, in Colorado specifically, but who within Americas or even across the globe, can we pull in to help engineer this dragon? So um, we worked with a couple of companies in Idaho and uh, pulled in a couple of engineers that we had in-house to be like, yeah, we've got the resources here in our open lab in the facility in Denver, um, but we've got our folks in Idaho who have experience with robotics specifically and making um, big robotic toys uh, for kids. So we can pull our expertise together to try and make this happen. Um, and my role specifically was to make sure that everybody played nice, um, that our, all of our ideas were heard um, and that we came up with a set of requirements that would work best to give Belle what she wanted. Um, yeah, a, a, a lot of that too, I think uh, to go into, it's kind of like what mindset you have to get into for this kind of a, a engineered solution. And that's in Belle's mind, right? So. Uh, if anybody has seen the video, I might have to share it with you guys if you don't have the clip, but she is an artist. She draws. Um, she watches a ton of dragon movies. She she plays dragon games. And so I myself had to put myself in her shoes and say, what about dragons is so cool? And I'm like, wait a minute. I watch How to Train Your Dragon, you know, the movie series. And I'm like, I love that series. That series is great. Or even just watching um, different fantasy-based TV shows. I'm like, what do I love best about dragons? Well, it flies, you know, it's got these cool scales, it's this giant lizard, like it. So putting myself in, in, her, in her head and saying, what is so cool about this and how can we bring that to light, uh, likeness within this dragon? So um, the way that it ended up happening was we literally took the drawing that Belle had to give us the, the layout, the sketch of what this physical dragon would look like to build for her um, and kind of sized it up based on practicality right from there and how to engineer it from there. So the dragon, it, for those who are uh, visually impaired, it's a purple dragon, like a lavender purple. It's got a pink underbelly and the dragon is based off of the Wings of Fire book series. She loves the silk wing dragons is what it's modeled from. Um, and so it's got antennas because it's kind of like a butterfly type of dragon and its wings are like that of a butterfly. So it's got kind of different membranes of different purple pinky ombres in there. Um, and then it's got little spikes along the spine. It's got pink claws because that's what she wanted. 
um, and giant purple eyes because you can see into the souls of these dragons. So um, this it's it's a toy that she, a companion that she wanted um, due to her um, inabilities to be able to have a physical pet herself. And so something that she could care for, something that she could teach, um, something that could look after her and make her feel good is, is what we were designing. And we pulled it together. <laughs> she loves it. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. And I think it's so powerful, kind of the how far reaching engineering innovation is mm -hmm. and the ways that teams come together, whether it be through education or whether it be through providing a, a, a child with her dream toy. Um, because she can't have another, a, a, a real animal, as you were saying. And it really, what you described really reminded me of the habit being to be empathetic. Um, can you speak specifically about what that looked like as an engineer? So we understand from what you described, how you had to put yourself in her shoes to understand her needs and why this was so inspiring to her. But now you're working on a team. What did, what did it mean to be empathetic as you were working on the different parts of this really, I know this project had to have a lot of a lot of active parts. So how did it, how were you empathetic in that aspect? Sure. Um, yeah, so that, that's a really good point that, because the empathy where you want to relate a lot to the customer, you also have to think like an engineer too, right? So to be able to say, she wants it this way. And we, you know, either say we absolutely have to get it this way, or how can we compromise? You know, what are our capabilities? What, what, Practically, what can we get done in this time frame? And the time frame is tight. So, um, being empathetic as an engineer to be like, okay, um, I know what specifications we had listed originally, but what can we modify that would give her the same functionality, give her the same look and feel, but not be as complex? Um, so being able to have the mindset to say, okay, this is the engineering it takes to give her like, you know, the, the God level functionality of this feature versus the maybe um, RC car version of this feature, right? So um, I think that was a, a, another aspect of empathy that I had to, had to keep in mind. Thank you. John, I have our final question for you. Um, as, uh, as we think about the future, um, we think about recruiting. Um, we think about um, developing and retaining strong teams that we've, that's kind of been our theme for our conversation. So as an executive um, who leads a global automotive mobility technology company, recruiting the best talent to design and produce advanced products and services is a top priority. So how can companies like Hitachi attract and further develop and then retain team members to meet the needs of the future? Yeah, so there's different aspects there, right? There's the attraction and then the retention, which are very different. Um, so one thing we've done uh, for attracting engineers is it's, you mentioned in the very beginning that there's a shortage of engineers. It's very difficult to find software engineers, systems engineers, these type of people. So if you wait until you have a need and then go out and try to find someone with that specific experience to fill that need, you'll be lucky to find it. And if you do, it's going to be really expensive. So what we try to do is build competency internally, hire young engineers straight out of college and put them in what we call our freshman program. So the freshman engineers at our company, and we bring them in, give them a general and engineering training, try to rotate them through different disciplines, different locations. Some, some get to go to Japan, some get to go to Germany, um, but build them in this two-year program so that when we do have a need, we have someone on the bench there to fill that need. Um, so that's one thing we're doing specifically. Other, other things you can do is um, we're in the automotive industry now. Um, with electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, automotive engineering is kind of cool again. You know, I went through a period of time when people were like, uh, you know, I don't want to be in the automotive in uh, industry, but now it's kind of cool again, and you have uh, cool companies entering and everything. So it's, it's attractive to young engineers. Um, so it's easier to recruit young engineers from a, a lot of different universities to come into the automotive industry. Um, and then you have to, your company itself has to have a mission that rings 
with these young engineers. And Hitachi's um, mission statement is all about social innovation and um, safety and environmental um, activities. And those things run through everything we do. Um, so if you can generate that type of mission statement, and if you're in an industry that's kind of cool, like the automotive industry now, um, it, you can recruit young talent, uh, but then you have to build and keep that young talent. Um, obviously, everyone looks at salaries. You've got to be competitive. Uh, that's just, just part of it. Um, but there's a lot of other things you can do. And what the pandemic taught us is that you don't have to go to the office every day, all day. You can work remotely. Um, so I haven't worked in an office for two years now. I've been, you know, working from my house and almost our entire team is working remotely now, which opens up a lot of other opportunities. I can now recruit people who don't live in Detroit. I can recruit people who live in Texas or North Carolina or, you know, somewhere where they may have a lot of software engineers to work on our team remotely. Um, you can even do that globally. Time zones get make it a little more difficult, but um, it really opened up the whole uh, recruiting area and field going through this uh, remote work aspect that we have uh, gone through recently. Um, and just, uh, just yesterday, I was in a meeting where the head of our human resources was talking about, you know, we have a lot of turnover. Um, everyone has turnover issues right now. Um, there's a shortage of new talent. And one thing he said that I thought was really good was, you know, you can look at employees in two ways. They're either raw material that you just use up or they're assets that you treasure. And we have to make sure that we're looking at our employees, whether it's the, you know, a new line worker to an executive in sales, we have to look at them as assets, not as raw material. I, I think that's a great place to end our conversation is how do we as engineers look at each other as valuable members of a community that work together, whether it be in education all the way through the career pipeline. Um, we are assets to one another and we have a big, we have some big shoes to fill and there is much more to be done. So I want to thank each of you for sharing your stories and your time. And I welcome Cynthia. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you so much, Delian. I think, you know, that was just an incredible conversation. I. I kept hearing so many marvelous habits and actions of innovation popping out, collaboration, challenge the rules, being empathetic. I love, John, what you ended on about thinking about engineers as assets that we need to treasure, uh, that it's a cool to be an engineer. And I would completely agree with that. Um, and as we celebrate National Engineers Week, I think that's a wonderful way to close. For all of you who tuned in with us today to this THF conversation, thank you so much for spending your time with us, uh, learning with this incredible panel. We invite you to learn more. Um, if you are able to come visit us in Dearborn, Michigan at the Henry Ford, there's so many stories to discover here. Find us online at thf.org. And however you are celebrating National Engineers Week, we hope that you are inspired from today's conversation to see the needs and develop solutions as we learned about today. So thank you all so much for your time and enjoy the rest of your February and your rest of your engineers week. <laughs>